Let's turn over in our Bibles to the 19th chapter of the book of John. And we so wanted to get finished last week with what our sermon was and our thoughts were, and it being Resurrection Sunday, but sometimes the Lord prohibits. And I think that He prohibits for a reason. Yes. And I think we need to always study the Bible prayerfully and carefully and teach the Bible appropriately and have the right context. Last week we had the opportunity to look at the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. And this is one of the mega themes of the book of Revelation. Behold, a white horse. And of course that word revelation means the unveiling. It doesn't unveil many things. There's not a plurality of things that the book unveils. It unveils one thing. It unveils one person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And your text, if you should wish a text, Revelation 19 at verse 11, Behold a white horse, and he that sat on him is called Faithful and True, and he doth judge and make war. So we see the Redeemer that's on a white horse. And not only do we see the Redeemer, we see the Redeemer's reputation. He is called Faithful and True. Where is he called Faithful and True? He's not called faithful and true in the world this morning. He's not called faithful and true by men in government. But in the church, in His bride, He ought to be called faithful and He ought to be called true. Meaning He'll do right by us. He's taken care of us. He's redeemed us. He's sealed us. And He's delivered us to the Father. And He's true. We can believe every word that was written about Him in the prophets. We can believe every word that was written about Him in the Gospels. We can believe every word that was written about him in the epistles. We can believe every word that is written about him in this Bible prophecy, the book of Revelation by the disciple that he loved named John. And then we worked our way over to John chapter number 1. And the second greatest man that ever lived, John the Baptist. He had a six-month ministry. But in that six-month ministry, we're still talking about it 2,000 years later. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God. In in John chapter 1, verse 29 through 36, and I hope that you marked it, that takes away the sin of the world. He said, This is he that is preferred before me, for he was before me. And we beheld him in the gospel account. And then we worked our way over to Bethany, to the tomb of Lazarus, in John chapter Number 11, when Jesus was with his disciples and the news came from Bethany to Jerusalem that Lazarus had died and Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. That's an important verse of Scripture in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. Because in that, Lazarus joins the fellowship of Abraham. Yes. Lazarus joins the fellowship of John the Baptist and that he can be called the friend of of God. Yes. There's a song in contemporary church world that says, I am a friend of God. You need to pause and read the Bible before you sing or play that song. That's a title to be had, the friend of God. Yes. And then at the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus, John eleven thirty five, 35, the greatest verse that's found anywhere in the entirety of the Bible, Jesus wept. Master of heaven and earth, he wept. The bright and the morning star and the bishop of our souls, he wept. The true vine and the good shepherd, he wept. A high priest touched with the very feeling of our infirmity, tempted in all points, even as we are yet, he without sin, that he can identify with us. He exclusively knew what it was to be human, and so much so that he knew what it was to lose somebody that he loved. And the Jews said, behold how he loved him. Yes. In past tense. Jesus didn't stop loving Lazarus when he died. Jesus still loved him. Oh, yes. Even so much so that he could say at the tomb, Lazarus, come forth. And him that was bound came forth. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. What a scene. Now today we find ourselves in the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John. The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ has been concluded. He's preached all the sermons that he needed to preach. He's performed all the miracles that he needed to perform. He had done nothing privately and kept it back from his disciples. And he's delivered unto Pilate. 
This is the hour for which Jesus primarily came into the world. You would be mistaken, and I don't think you believe this. I know you don't believe this. That Jesus didn't come here just to live a perfect life. Jesus didn't come just to perform miracles. Jesus didn't come just to preach the Sermon on That's the right. Mount. That's right. Jesus come to be that final sacrifice for sin mm -hmm. forever. Yes. For this cause came I into the world. He said, the hour has come, and as now is, that the Son of Man should be laid into the hands of sinful men. Verse 1 of John chapter 19. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus, and he scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns, and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe, yes. and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto him, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know, and that I may find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing a crown of thorns, a purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. This is one of our favorite places in Israel, boy, to visit. And in the Latin, from the Latin Vulgate edition of the Bible, he said, Ecce homo. And so when you walk the way of the cross, and I want to remind everyone again, you will not find it in Scripture that Jesus ever fell. He did not fall, even though they bid Simon the Cyrenian uh, to help carry his cross. It wasn't because he had fallen, and you can't find that suggested. But walking through the old streets of Jerusalem and today, my father and I, and boy, I would that, as your father, that we had had the opportunity, but they have built a Muslim high school there. And they no longer allow you to go down subterranean, about 25 feet. And when you get down there subterranean, it's now in the basement of this Muslim high school, the actual place of pavement. And John calls it Gabbatha. Gabbatha, the place of pavement. You can even see in the place of pavement where the horse's shoes struck the pavement. You can see the game of kings that the soldiers began to play of how long they anticipated that a victim would last. Would they even make it out to the cross? It is all there. And it's a, a sight to behold. A, a very, to me, a very sacred place that you're not allowed to visit in Israel at this particular time and for many years now because the Muslims, uh, they occupy that portion of Jerusalem that's just there next to the Temple Mount. And so when he brings him forth, he says, Eke homo, and him being a Roman, this would have been his language. Behold the man. Have I not done enough to him? Are you not satisfied by now? Now, we're going to go through Revelation. We're going to have the seven seals. We're going to have the seven trumpets. And then all the way up to the last part of the three and a half years of the tribulation, the bows of wrath. And God the Father is going to say, you've done enough. You've denied him. You've defamed him. You've rebuked him. You've never even beheld him. You've never even looked at him completely and examined him thoroughly, but you want to give a label to him. It's sad what we notice in our world today. Jesus just won among the prophets. And so Pilate wanted them to be sufficed. Haven't I done enough? Everyone can turn toward the beautiful stained glass windows. Look at the scourges and the whipping post. And in that cat of nine tails, that's what they called it. Bone, glass, and metal. If you think that he was just whipped with a leather whip, you've got a bad misconception. And no one could identify it like our friend Walter K. Ayers. He said his ribs shone like great red fingers of ivory. And when they wrapped that lash around him and pulled it away, they tore away the flesh and the muscle that even his ribs were exposed. And Pilate thought, surely, surely they'll be satisfied. They wouldn't want to go any further than this. 
but they did. I think when you, we look at the 18th and 19th chapter of the Gospel of John, then you get to the 27th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and you find the account of the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ. You would not know a lot about the Bible if you think that Pilate wanted to send Jesus to the cross. You see those questions that are asked in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John. Are you the king of the Jews? Did someone else tell you this? Or did you come to this conclusion on your own, governor? Are you then a king? He left out the Jews. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants rise and fight that I wouldn't be delivered hence. Well, it's the Jews that's delivered you. Yes. Am I a Jew? Don't you know I have the power to let you go or the power to crucify? You have no power, governor, over me at all, except it were given to you from above. Yes. Everyone that heareth my voice heareth truth. Pitiful. This Roman governor, what is truth? He was so perplexed. And then he comes out and gives this great proclamation. I find no fault in this man at all. And then he said, I'll just scourge him. European Western iconography have him in a loin cloth with some stripes on him. Hmm. The Eastern Roman world, let me describe it. He was completely and utterly naked. Yes. Everybody that was in that crowd could identify him as a man. It was important that that part of the Lord Jesus Christ be exposed. He despised the shame, Hebrews 12. I know that's a little risque. Maybe not, because we're in this Western world. Yes. It was important for everybody to know he has all the propensities and desires that a natural man would have, yet he, without sin. The book of Isaiah said he was marred more than any other man, and his appearance more than the sons of men, his visage yeah. more than the sons of men. By the time the Lord Jesus got to the cross, after the place of the pavement, after the cat of nine tails, when he was hanging there, he was not even identifiable as human. He was so swollen. Yes. He was so beaten. He was so bruised. But when we look at it, and we find ourselves there, when we stand in that crowd and see the Roman governor bring him out and say, Eke homo, behold the man, him with a purple robe, him with a crown of thorns, and then they stripped him and he was naked, we can say, by stripes, we're healed. Yes. Matthew 27. Read it with us. You look as I read, beginning at verse 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Verse 13, Matthew 27. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch, oh, I wished I could control mine. The governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast of the governor was wont to release the people, a prisoner whom they would. And they had their notable prisoner, his name was Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom will you that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Lots happening in our world at this prophetic time that is just out and out envy. And when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The world's still trying to destroy him. He's never been destroyed and he never will be. 
He's risen with all power and with all authority. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christos, threefold office holder? He didn't know it, but maybe he did. Prophet, priest, and king. There's never been another one, and there never will be. And the governor said, What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Paul, Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Then answered all the people, This is so prophetic. Let his blood be on us and our children. And it has been. And the historical record proves that it has been. And so they're going to look upon the one now when he returns that 19th chapter. The one mounted upon a white horse who is called faithful and true. Zechariah chapter 14 is the parallel to Revelation chapter 19. And he's actually, after he goes up in the northern part of Israel, and wins the victory at Armageddon according to Revelation 16, 16 and Revelation 19, then he's going to sit down on the Mount of Olives from this viewpoint. And they're going to look upon the one whom they have pierced. And I say, hallelujah. What a day that will be. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But in the same chapter, boy, we have the witnesses. And uh, Jesus said, quoting the Old Testament law, Matthew 18, 16, that everything be confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So in verse 4, it begins with Judas, mark it, I have betrayed the innocent blood. Judas realized what he had done, the innocent blood. 24, Pilate says, I find no fault in this just man, but look at 54. And look at the centurion. And we don't have enough time, but we can just give a few words about him that are so very pertinent. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and heard those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was, and again past tense, praise his name, he still is, Alpha and Omega, this was the Son of God. And boy, I love Mark's account. And Mark says in Mark 15, 39, the centurion moved over against Jesus. Like he drew a line and said, I'm on his side. Think about it this way. We've been there. We sing the song on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. We have no record that Jesus was crucified on a hill, and I love the song. I'm not saying we shouldn't sing it. Mm -hmm. Jesus was crucified next to a road. He was taken out of the Damascus gate. He was taken to the place of the skull, and that's where the road that led to Damascus went. And that's what the Roman Empire did. They crucified criminals next to the road so people could see it, sit there and watch them die, watch them suffocate over and over again so it would curb crime in their provinces. And that's what they did with the Lord Jesus Christ. They put him there between two thieves. Yes. We know that. Jesus was not elevated above the people. Jesus was placed where the people could come and mock him. Jesus was placed where the people could come and spit on him. And they did. Now you think about this Roman centurion. He said, I've had enough of watching them mock him. I've had enough of watching them spit on him. I've had enough of watching them deride him and throw things at him because there wasn't a Jew in the entire city of Jerusalem that would have dared spit on a Roman centurion. He moved over to defend him. That's important. And then he makes that great declaration. If anyone thinks that we're going too far, in Luke's account, and Luke, a medical doctor, was interested in the death of this man above anyone else he had ever attended to. And I've watched a lot of people die. And I've seen some that would do this. But even in that moment, the centurion moved over there and said, truly this man was the Son of God. He stood over against him according to Mark 15, 39. Luke 23, 47, 
says he glorified God. And we want to have it in our minds, the possibility that this was Cornelius of Acts chapter 10, Roman centurion, that the gospel from a Jew to a Gentile was first recorded. Peter from Joppa goes to the house of Cornelius, a Roman centurion that loved the nation of Israel. Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. <laughs> Acts 10, 33. Could it be? Very possible. Could it be? It, it could very possibly be. But for I'll do a little infomercial. We'll get back to it. Dr. Oliver B. Green's book, and for all of you, I've got still plenty of them. Over 40 years old, we found these in storage at the store of the Lord bookstore. Been there for over 40 years. Three men that witnessed Calvary and walked away. One of the greatest messages I have ever read in all of my life. If you want one, they're available, even our TV audience, and we want to inform, we want to educate. Let me give a warning. Superficial Christianity. That day's past. You're not going to make it on it. Emotional Christianity. You better know the Bible. You better get into it. I read it on Wednesday evening, and I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings. But it was in the still, small voice that God spoke to Elijah. You better get to the point that you can hear God in that still, small voice. And some people go away and don't get offended. And I love it, and I love to shout and pray and sing as much as anyone. Lord came by today. Boy, we had a meeting. Man, wasn't that good? I'm telling you, the Lord was in the house. I got news for you. He's here all the time. And most of the time, He don't speak to me in the shout. And I love to laugh when you're shouting. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. Remember all the young people, boy, y'all used to sit on the front row, and Brother Nichols, he'd get up on that walking stick and take a shout and raise that walking stick up. How many remembers that? And he's a genius, a chemistry genius, a biblical genius, and shout. And all these young people laughing, and a lady wrote in for TV and said, those young people are laughing at that old man shouting. I said, you don't know what you're talking about, sister. No. They're not laughing at him. They're laughing with him. They feel the joy of it. And he attracted them. And I never have seen anyone of his age have so many young people at their funeral. as what he had. I mean, they came out in droves because he had that magnetism of the joy of the Lord in his life, and he demonstrated it. And so here this man witnessed all this, and he said, there has to be an announcement. Somebody needs to say something. This just three hours of darkness, the earthquake. I dare not go because I don't even know how to go here. Even on resurrection morning, there was an earthquake. You find me an author, a commentary, that it can explain it. I've never been able to identify it. That when the stone was rolled away in the earthquake, many of the saints got up out of their graves and went into Jerusalem and testified. That's the 50, I, huh? 53rd verse of 27. Yes, sir. And I don't know how to put all that together, but I know it's real. And I know it happened. Did they go back and die again? I'm not trying to get us off track. I'm telling you, God is a God of the miraculous. God is a God of the supernatural. You can't always put him in your little neat little box. And then I don't want to put him in the box that that was the first resurrection and the rest of us have missed it. How many wants to be a part of the first resurrection? Y'all don't know what I'm talking about yet, do you? Uh, those that have part in the first resurrection, the second death hath no power over them. And I sure don't want to die once, if die twice. If I've died once, how many say, once will be enough, preacher? That's all I want. Death ain't no big deal. You've been listening to me Southern Gospel songs. Death is a big deal for the one that's walked just as close to the Lord as anybody could ever walk. For one that has strayed and just gotten right in their last moments. It's the last enemy we're going to have to face. But thank God Jesus has already faced it for us. And everything we're going through is just a preliminary to get us ready for that ultimate final test. 
of facing the one that Jesus has taken the keys from and the sting out of. And I say, bless his high and holy name. I don't believe the centurion was ever the same. Don't believe it. We have went down through the witnesses. First, Judas takes the witness stand and he says, I betrayed thee innocent blood. Then Pilate says, I find no fault in him. I don't want this man's innocent blood on my hands. Then the centurion takes the witness stand and says, surely this man was the son of God. In between all that, the father takes the witness stand. And the veil of the temple was split. Access was granted. We have a prerogative to approach the Father. What was concealed in the tabernacle, what was concealed in the temple, that only one man, once a year, under the right protocol, under the right pedigree, could go back and visit in the presence of God. Now all that can come that are weary and heavy laden. We have access. So the Father had to take the witness stand. And then the Spirit said, I can't be left out, but I'll wait to take the witness stand. He took the witness stand on a Sunday morning when he ascended back down into the tomb and brought again to life the good shepherd of the sheep and raised him up. And I think about it. We see his last public appearance where he was marred more than any other man, his visage more than the sons of man. We've already covered that from the book of Isaiah chapter Number 52, we think about him there with his title, King of the Jews in Latin and Greek and Hebrew. And the Jews go back to Pontius Pilate and say, take it down. Only that he said he was King of the Jews. And Pilate responded, what I've written, I've written. Now out. And then Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus that came to him by night (laughs) in John chapter number 3. They go and petition Pilate for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can think it was a scene where he just bowed his head and he was easy to get off the cross, but that traumatic death, rigor mortis had already set in. His mouth was gaped open. His eyes were gaped open. He had probably lost his bowels when he died. It was that nasty, that grotesque, uh, that real, the death that Jesus died. Nobody ever died like the Lord Jesus Christ died. He didn't bow his head and it was just something that was over. It was horrible. It was traumatic. And no doubt, they had to take his arms and bend them down. And they tried to clean all the blood, all the material, all the stuff that was on him off. Yes. And they placed him in a tomb where never a man had laid Joseph of Arimathea's tomb so that the prophecy of Isaiah could be complete, that he made his death with the wicked and his grave with the rich. Jesus died according to the scriptures and those divine (laughs) arms that had reached and those divine hands that had healed and those divine eyes that had saw and those divine ears that had heard and that divine mouth that had begun to speak and those divine limbs that moved and spread the word of the Father and preached the gospel to the poor. They were shut down by death. His kingdom reduced to the dimensions of a grave. But that was Thursday. But on Sunday morning, God brought him back to life. Now, I've always thought, what did Jesus wear? I think the Father had him clothes ready. And I think the angels come down and brought him to him and said, Son, now you've been here long enough. Yes. It's time to go. Yes. And the greatest fact of theology, the greatest fact of history, is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. His resurrection by the Spirit proves He was an acceptable sacrifice for sin forever that I don't have to add to it. I don't have to take away from it. I can look at the empty grave and say that Jesus is enough for me to get to heaven. Amen. Amen. So when John said, Behold the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world, 29 and 35 of John chapter 1, it is the answer to Abraham and Isaac. And Isaac said, Here's the wood. We carry a little vessel of fire. But where's the sacrifice? And in 22 and 8 of Genesis, Abraham says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. God had to be appeased. Appeased. I'm coming back. 
We love to put the scripture together, line upon line, precept upon precept. And so after it was done, and Isaac and Abraham goes walking down Moriah together, a scene of a resurrection, but there was not a death because Isaac was not an appropriate sacrifice. He named the place Jehovah Jireh. God hath provided himself a sacrifice. So where is the lamb? And John answers back to Abraham over the centuries. Here he is. Here he is. Where is the complete, final, supreme sacrifice? Resurrection says, here it is. Romans 4.25, He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. And we love to sing it in the old words that say, Living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified, freely forever. Is that the end of the story? One day He's coming. One day is coming. Oh, glorious day. Hebrews 9. He hath appeared. He doth now appear. And he shall appear. Pararuso. The three appearings of our wonderful Lord. To prove. To make manifest. And so he made it manifest. And so Romans 5 begins like this. Therefore being justified by faith. Let me believe that Jesus rose again from the dead. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access into this grace wherein we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, knowing that tribulation work of patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope that we have today, it maketh not ashamed, because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which has been given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Preadventure for a good man someone even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And wherefore God has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. Oh, I'm glad he appears right now in the presence of God. I mean, he's thankful that Jesus is there right now making intercession for us. I mean, he's thankful that he did appear. But how many is thankful for this blessed hope? We are waiting for him to appear. And when we study it, we look at it, and boy, has scratched the surface of it, and I've tried just to come along in scotch for him. This man deserves to be seen. This man deserves to be heard. This man deserves to be recognized. In America, God help us. We have come to a Christless Christianity. Everything is mentioned in church but Jesus. I want to hear him. I want to know him. And the reason we're teaching the revelation, it's not the revelation of a calendar that we can set our clocks by. It's the revelation of the Christ that lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death, rose the third day at the right end of the Father, coming back in clouds of glory. He's the one that needs to be seen. And God forbid that we brag on anything else. We can't even brag on having church during a pandemic. Hush. Hush. We've been going. We've been doing this. Only thing we can honor is the Lord. Only thing we can brag on is His grace and mercy that sustained us every step of the way. Government's not our God. God is God. His Son is the risen Son of God, alive forevermore, getting ready to be revealed to a lost and dying world. It's going to happen. (laughs) 
a shaking between every change of covenants and dispensations. A shaking. You think everything's going to be unshaken? It's going on now. Getting ready to be a change. We're headed for the 10th chapter of Revelation. And those nail-scarred feet, one's going to be planted on the land, other's going to be planted on the sea. He said, you got three and a half years left, and I'm declaring it right now. Time is coming. That time will be no more. I'm bringing it to a halt. He's the only answer. I don't know of another answer. I don't know of another remedy. I don't know of another hope for the world. I don't know anything that can satisfy me concerning tomorrow. But Jesus, I don't know of anything else but Him. He's going to be unveiled to the world in all of His glory. This man, never been one like Him, never will be again. I've uh, spent the past 10 years sick. I don't know, and no one here knows what we're going to be in a year, what this virus is going to do. No one knows the efficacy of this vaccine. Don't pretend like you do. Is there any virologist here today? Is there any molecular biologist? Is there any epidemiologist? You've got an MD behind your name. Then be quiet. We don't know, and even they don't know. God knows. He knows the end from the beginning. Yes. And He knows all things that lay in there between. And when you've suffered and seen people suffer personally, corporately in the church, the problem that we have is that the emotion is trying to kill the spirit in the church. Everybody's over towards the emotion. When, am I, when is my emotion going to be satisfied again? Listen, I've become ext- extremely emotional. When I read this account and I, st- yes, sir. Yeah. I stand there in that judgment hall, <laughs> it's unbelievable. Heartbroken yeah. at the cross where he died for the world of sinners. Not the elect, not the good, the bad. I think if I needed a kidney, I could probably find a volunteer here and among these men that love me to give me one. I, I wouldn't shock me for that to happen. And we've had that process in the church with my aunt. People volunteered, thank God for them. But when I go out here and I drive around this town and I see these prostitutes and drug addicts on the street, and I think that Jesus didn't die for the sins of the good, but he bought and died for the sins of the bad. Yes. And if I had to be good to qualify, I wouldn't have qualified. When I was born, we were in poverty. If I had to be rich, I wouldn't have qualified. If I had to be smart, I've had a great education. I'm not that smart. I wouldn't qualify. The only thing that I had to do to qualify was to come. And it's the universal salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been made a partaker of the divine inheritance of the saints that are in glory. Praise his name. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I've asked now for weeks, and I'm asking again today, let's repent. And Christian, please, last Easter, Morgan was here, you were here, these wonderful technicians. I want us to thank our men with the cameras and the equipment. I want to let them know that we appreciate them. (laughs) Singers were here. They were here and so wonderful. But I got on my knees beside of that little podium I was using. And I repented. I repented. He said, preacher, what would you have to repent of? Everything. Everything. I am repulsed by self-righteous Christians that think they've gone far enough 
This is as good as I need to do. Everybody's asking me, what should I do, preacher? I want to do something. Pray. We can't do anything better. Pray in the morning, in the evening, before you pillow your head at night. Get on your knees before the Lord. Politicians are not our answers. Midterm elections are not our answers. Change in the Congress, the Senate, they're crazy. Both sides, they don't know where to stand. They don't know what to do. This is unprecedented. It's epic. I've said that from the beginning. 